inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and leverage commonalities. Let's do away with political correctness, explore ideation, build community, and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast, and this is Bertine Crevacore West. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. My name is Bertine Crevacore West, and I am your host. I'm delighted to have with us today Miss Jacquinese, also known as Jay Washington. Jay, can you say hello to our guests? Hi, gal, gals and guys. I'm happy gals to be here today. <laughs> well, welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. We're so delighted to have you, and I've been looking forward to having you on the show. So I'm going to tell our guests a little bit about you. So, okay. Japanese Washington is a two-time graduate of Delaware State University, where she received her Master of Public Administration and Bachelor of Arts in Mass Communications degrees. Jay is the CEO of the Savvy Solution LLC, where she freelances her skills and expertise to organizations and businesses with strategic needs in planning and execution, internal and external communications, and public relations and outreach. Previously, she worked as an outreach programs coordinator for Gwinnett County government, where she developed and implemented a strategic outreach plan and served as the department liaison in supporting relationships with community stakeholders. Prior to that, she worked as NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Yes, y'all, I said NASA. <laughs> as an executive speechwriter and communication strategist, where she led the executive communication strategy for four NASA directors. Before returning to the South in 2018, Jay served as an executive assistant and communication strategist to the cabinet secretary for the Delaware Department of Health and Social Services, among other roles in academia at Delaware State University. Jay is an experienced and passionate public servant and advocate for the growth and development of others. This is underscored by her self-produced podcast, School of Life, where she candidly tackles the topic of adulting and navigating the millennial life post-college. In her downtime, Jay enjoys spending time with her family, shopping, snuggling with a good book, or writing poetry. Jay is originally from Birmingham, Alabama, and currently lives in Snellville, Georgia. Jay, once again, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's always so weird when people read your bio. It's like, wait, that's me. <laughs> that's right. All these fabulous things that were done, they were done by you. <laughs> <laughs> so I love um, just seeing the, the, the kind of career that you've had and the evolution of it all, and mm -hmm. particularly because you're a millennial and you are, you know, so young, and to have accomplished all of that in such a short span of time is beyond impressive. <laughs> Thank and so you. I wish um, your podcast was around when I was in college, <laughs> because I, was like, I wish someone had said this stuff. So First, tell us a little bit about the School of Life podcast, because it, I listened to some episodes and I was telling you off air that I found it refreshing. I found it funny. I found it just, it was like girl <laughs> chat, which I really I love. And I think it's a great way to have other generations such as Gen Xers like me, you know, um, traditionalists, baby boomers, have them listen to this to get mm -hmm. that millennial perspective because this is a component of diversity that okay. I think has to be explored. So I commend you and I thank you um, for starting this podcast. I think it's fantastic and I love interviewing fellow podcasters. So, <laughs> tell, us, right? <laughs> so tell us a bit more about the School of Life podcast. Yes, yeah, so I had the idea for the School of Life podcast maybe about 
three years ago and I just launched it last year, 2019. So I had the idea maybe like 2016, 2017. And I was literally sitting at my kitchen table. This is when I lived in Delaware and it was my best friend. And uh, we would always get together to complain about this new adult thing that we had to do. Like I have to get up and go to work every morning and then pack a lunch and then come home and be productive. Like it was just stressing us all the way out. So weekly people would just come to my house and we would just complain about it and figure out how can we just live our best adult lives. And so I said, you know what, why didn't they teach us some of this in college? And so that turned into a whole conversation. And literally I just had the idea like, you know, I'll just start a podcast about it. And so my friends are like, yeah, yeah, start it. It'll be great. But I was kind of just joking until maybe a year later, I just felt a nagging feeling to just do it. And so I still put it off. And eventually I finally got around to it. I got the courage to do it. I knew nothing about podcasting. I didn't know what equipment to buy. I didn't even know what to search on Google. You know, Google can teach you a lot of things. So <laughs> it all eventually it all eventually came together and the the basis was just to talk about things that you don't learn in college that you truly need to survive adulthood or what the millennials are calling adulting we've made it into a verb because it is the actual thing you have to do so um yeah that's the basis I, I try to explore topics um from a professional development standpoint, from personal development, financial aspect, like spiritual, whatever I can do to just let other people who are my age, or who may not even be my age, like you know, like it's okay to not have it all together because the truth is we're all just figuring it out. I know sometimes people make it seem like they have it together, but no one does and that's okay. So that's the basis of it. And I'm so glad you have listened to it and enjoy it. Um, it's like my baby now and I truly enjoy producing it and hosting it. It's fantastic. And I encourage all of our listeners to, to really go listen to the School of Life podcast. Again, whatever age you might be, I think yes. it, there's something in it for everybody. Because as you said, not everyone has it together. You know, mm -hmm. even though, and I love that adulting has been made into a verb. So thank you millennials out there. Because <laughs> it was never really a way to describe mm -hmm. it as an active process, at least not in my opinion. Right. And so, you know, when I hear that, like, it always makes me laugh, first of all. <laughs> real talk, right? It's one of yes. those things where I'm just like, oh, okay, this gives me some insight into how things are for millennials right now. What's mm -hmm. different? What's the same as from when I went mm -hmm. to college, you know? And I do like love how it touches on all aspects from the professional to the personal, mm -hmm. including the spiritual. And, you know, there was one um, line that I remember where um, you were interviewing and I, episode nine was the one that is my favorite thus far, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just like, wow, this is some truth here. And you were talking to your guest and, you know, she mentioned how, or you mentioned that you have a whole generation on your back, right? And yes. that to me was so poignant because it really, because I think everything goes into diversity. I really do. Um, different mm -hmm. perspectives, points of view, age differences, right? And mm -hmm. so I thought to myself, wow, you know, that is such a poignant statement because that is what we all experience, right? We yeah. are literally um, riding on the shoulders of those who came before us, but mm -hmm. with that comes the responsibilities, comes the burdens, mm -hmm. comes the emotional baggage, yeah. comes all of these things, right, that that we have to carry with us. And and I won't even say have to, but we thought mm -hmm. we had to carry with us. Right, right. right? And this is where a difference um, in mindset comes. There's a shift, right? Mm -hmm. And so there goes that diversity component where we have a, a diversity in our thinking styles, right? Yeah. So you and I may think, you know, you see how everybody, I just put myself in there as so much <laughs> <now>, but, <laughs> but you and I may think, you know, well, we know that we have other alternatives to deal with that and that we mm -hmm. don't have to carry baggage that's mm -hmm. not our own right? Yeah. Um, we've got our own bags. We don't need all those, those heavy yes. bags, right? Yes. The light ones, no worries, right? But the right. heavy bags, right? And I wonder, you know, even with regard to, to things like spirituality and seeking mm -hmm. therapy and, you know, things like that, having open dialogue with your friends mm -hmm. and peers and your colleagues, you know, that is something that perhaps um, generations before us didn't 
engage in as much. Yeah. It wasn't what was done. Right. right. So I love that you created this space where there's this openness of dialogue and it touches mm -hmm. on so many different aspects. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm so, so glad you enjoyed it. I did. I did. I, I laughed. I was just like, what is happening? And then I was like, <laughs> yeah, that's real. That's real too. So now I'm going to jump back a little bit because I was so excited about the podcast, but I want you to <laughs> I was. I was like, we've got to get that out there. So I want you to tell us a bit about your professional background and your training and your current company, The Savvy Solution. Yes. So my professional background is all wrapped into me being a strategic communicator. So I went to Delaware State University, like you said, and I fell in love with just the art of being able to tell a story. And one thing that um, Colin undergrad specifically taught me was um, there are so many different stories in the way that social media and interacting with people has changed over the years, has created this field of jobs for people like me who are good storytellers and who can strategically tell a story no matter what the story is. A lot of my professional work has been in crafting messaging. Um, I worked in government for as long as I've been working, which hasn't been super, super long. <laughs> but um, I've always worked in government and I've enjoyed being able to do what I love as well as feel a sense of uh, making a difference. You know, government is that pillar of making a difference in people's lives. And then I went on to receive my master's degree because I'm like, hey, I need to be more educated and more marketable out here. And so that really played a big part in um, me just getting getting out there to do something different I went for public administration and fell in love with that as well I have just all these loves and I wish I could just bundle them up <laughs> but um I, all of my work has been in storytelling when it was at NASA when it was working for uh, the state of Delaware previously I worked in uh, Pennsylvania so just telling the story I'm the storyteller they the storyteller so now I have decided I'm taking a small little break from telling other people's stories um, from a full-time job perspective. And I've launched my own company, The Savvy Solution. And yes. The Savvy Solution is all about how can I help you um, achieve optimal results? Like, what can I do to help your organization, your business, your church group, your girls group, whatever it is, how can I help you develop these solutions and so in a sense still telling somewhat of that story but I get to add like my heart to the work that I get to do with different organizations and different businesses because I'm so people driven like I want to be all up in your business not because I'm nosy but because I want the best for you and so because I'm like, I like that. I a little bit of spice <laughs> right I have a little bit of spice and sass and stuff and you know what that's that's savvy and so I came up with this idea and this concept that I'm here to do whatever you know I know what my strengths are and I know what my weaknesses are and I just believe that I can find you a solution to whatever problem you have so that's what I'm doing now and I'm enjoying it and it's going well and it's just refreshing to finally kind of just be present in all of who I am without being confined by company policy or uh, an office culture so yeah it, it's going well I'm enjoying it I love that that you said to be present in who you are um, without being confined because I I feel like um, as a serial entrepreneur myself right and I see this in the path that you're on as well yes. <laughs> um, right? there's we do different things but there's mm -hmm. one thing that ties it all together and yours is yes. helping people and telling yep. their story, right? And so I've always said to people, mine is um, training and helping to educate, right? Even mm -hmm. though that may come in the form of, you know, um, the CEO of Westbridge Solutions or the host of the Global Fluency Podcast yep. or as an author, it all ties into, yeah. you know, helping to educate and spread the word about things, mm -hmm. right? So um, I often find, and I said this, I think you and I, yeah, when we were having an offline conversation, I mentioned this to you that um, at some point in my career, and I know that this is applicable to you as well, um, I stopped worrying about trying to get other people to understand um, mm -hmm. what it is that I did by minimizing mm -hmm. myself and just saying, oh, I train people, right? Yeah. But instead, you know, because that was their limitation and not necessarily yeah. mine. And so mm -hmm. at one point I just said, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, you know, I'm a businesswoman, yeah. 
you know, and then I'll talk to them about the different things that I do. Mm -hmm. And so for you, I see the same evolution. Yes. <laughs> people are saying, oh, you do this, you do that. Um, what do you do? And they look confused. Right. And what we tend to do, particularly as women, what we tend to do is minimize our, our mm -hmm. self our accomplishments. And I was like, nope, that time is gone, you know? Right. And so right. I think that you're doing the same thing. And I'm, I'm super proud of you. I'm, I'm super excited for you. And I can't wait um, to see what your next steps are. Thank you. So now, moving on to our next question, because your work does deal with diversity and it does deal with inclusion. Mm -hmm. So tell me about your experiences with diversity and inclusion. Ooh, how long do we have here? Right? You've got <laughs> more episodes for all of that, right? <laughs> yeah, so I find it so a little bit funny that even just as a millennial in my young 20s, I have had this journey and I'm still on the journey and I have experiences with diversity and inclusion, and they have been somewhat traumatizing because I think growing up, we don't think that we will, like we listen to our parents and they like try to warn us about things and we're just like, oh no, mom, that's not going to happen to me. I'm right. not going to be stereotyped <laughs> because I'm a black woman. And then it happens and you're 22 and you're working and you think it's a dream job and you're like, wait, what do I do? So my experiences have been rooted in being young. I've always been the youngest person, sometimes in the entire building of like yeah, a thousand people. I believe people. you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm young, uh, I'm Black, and mm -hmm. I'm a millennial. And then even you mentioned like having a diversity yeah. of thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm female. I think differently and I even carry myself differently. So my experience has always been people judge me before I even get to the room or get to the office or get to the door and I've found, found myself silently fighting along the journey like asking oh, questions and trying to silently figure out fighting. like <laughs> yes silently fighting and trying to figure out why are things the way that they are you know I'm the person in the office I am going to ask why it is the way it is and I may ruffle some feathers and so <laughs> a lot of the work that I've championed with diversity and inclusion from a work standpoint has been I don't want to say I've been like the rebel but I've been I inquisitive I want to know <laughs> I'll, you know I'll own it I've been the rebel I have asked questions and I have pushed the limits and I've, I'm proud of myself for pushing the limits but those limits have sometimes put me in situations that compromise my job and they um, made people question me as a person because I question what was the tradition or what was the culture so I'm proud that I've had an experience that's been very eye-opening um, but it's kind of hard as a, a young person to navigate well if I'm going to exist in this world how do I exist knowing that this is the way it is right now and I still have to kind of deal with it and put up with it and live with it so that's the place I am now on my journey just like toying the line between do I speak or do I not you know like our parents raised us to speak up but now they're saying well don't speak up too loud and so it's just like well which one is it you know I don't know which which ways to go here now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor Westbridge Solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity, inclusion, cultural competence, and soft skills trainings. Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in-person and online, live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, government organizations, healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, Trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, please feel free to visit their website at www.westgrouptraining.com or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. Yeah, yeah, that's where I am. It's a learning. Yeah, you it's a thing I have to learn because it's it's a journey, right? And then when we're on that journey, mm -hmm. the it's it's almost as if because what I'm hearing from what you said is that 
at some point, that journey that we're taught that we are about to take changes. Mm-hmm. There's no sign mm-hmm. that says turn left here or go right. Here or turn right, right? So then it becomes yeah. a question of, okay, do I, you know, how do I maintain my, my true sense of self without compromising my principles? Yes, right? yeah, And exactly. you're taking me back, like, really and truly <laughs> 20 years ago when I would be the youngest in my group. And you yes. know, sometimes, a lot of times I would not only be the youngest, but, you know, the only mm-hmm. person in the room. You know, mm-hmm. and, and I was just learning how to navigate, you know, yeah. waters that, but I didn't think were going to be an issue. Right, you know? right. I was just like, oh no, this is not going to happen. And right. you know, that's not going to happen. And then when it does, you're like, oh no, what do I do? And right. there's no answer, right? And so that this yeah. still exists is, you know, it's, it's mind boggling to me. And yet at the same time, it's not surprising. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think that, you know, having that conversation, always having that conversation, continue to mm-hmm. have that conversation or continuing to have it, um, that is going to be how everyone discovers, you know, mm-hmm. those, those, you know, cultural, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Those, those cultural traffic signs um, that we yes. need to help navigate us through these. Two, we uh, surely need them. <laughs> winding roads out here in these streets. <laughs> I, I really think like uh, back when um, I was working in New York, I remember thinking, yeah, there's a reason it's called the concrete jungle, you know? And, yes. Yeah. And now that I am here in Atlanta, I was like, oh, nothing's changed, you right, know, right. So less jungle, but still concrete. Yeah. <laughs> you concrete. Know? Yes. Very. <laughs> yeah. So I think, like I said, this is going to, you know, this, your experience, you know, vis-a-vis, um, what you have learned, what you have mm-hmm. taught, and what you have taught yourself, right, on yes. how to navigate those paths. It's going to, it's going to help other people, not only your fellow millennials, but I, I definitely think it will help other generations see and better understand your mm-hmm. struggle, right? And yes. you know, this way, we have some common ground from which to build upon, right? Mm-hmm. And then perhaps it will shift the way we have conversations, right? Yes, um, that's the help. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, definitely, because I know um, I used to, to really, it used to bother me so much when people would speak to me like I was a kid. You oh, know? gosh, yes, I'm but triggered. It, I did. <laughs> yes, yes, it was a trigger, and I'm thinking, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm a grown-up, you know, I'm yes. a working in corporate America. I'm not <laughs> little, and because I'd be the age of their daughter, and I'm like, yeah. the, the workplace, you know, so right. how do we change those, those conversations? And again, I think when, when, you know, other generations listen to what millennials mm-hmm. are saying and vice versa, when, Melissa, when millennials listen to what other generations are saying, yes. it's this safe space of not only psychological safety, um, mm-hmm. because we all have more in common than we do that's different, but those differences, mm-hmm. you know, I think we need to embrace them. Um, because yes. I pride myself on having friends of all different ages. And I love, you know, yes. my colleagues of all different ages because it broadens my perspective and it enhances mm-hmm. my life. So, you know, again, that's why I, I love the work that you're doing to create space for this type of conversation. Yes. Yeah, and this mutual understanding. So I'm going to ask you this. So with regard to cultural competence, diversity, and inclusion. Well, you know what? Let me backtrack a little. Let's talk about inclusion and diversity. Okay. I always like to ask our guests what that means to them. Because for me, it yes. means two different things, right? And I think a lot of times mm-hmm. people lump them together and I'm like, oh, but they're not the same. So right. give me your definition of diversity and give me your definition of inclusion. Yes. So I um, heard this great analogy was it it was a few years it was when I worked at NASA actually so a few years ago um and I made that my definition so diversity is we've invited different people to the party different ages different races um different genders different backgrounds any person you can think of we've invited them to the party but inclusion is making sure we've asked everyone do you want to dance do you want to drink what kind of dance do you want to do? Because I may want to do the cha-cha slide, but you may want to do a different dance, you know, Pinch just shuffle. making sure at the party. <laughs> right. <laughs> you may want to drop it to the floor like it's hot. I don't know. But um, the inclusion piece is really <laughs> when you're at the party, 
attending to your guests in ways that they need because everyone doesn't need the same thing I may not want punch while I'm at the party I may just want to dance and it's like a funny analogy but to me that's what it is and I feel like that can translate in almost any setting like have you invited the people okay you invited them but did you include them in the activities that will be held at the event in the work at the meeting, uh, at the conference. So those are my definitions. Jay, you know what? I say we're kindred spirits and I so mean that. <laughs> that, is, that is the, for me, that's the best definition because um, mm -hmm. uh, I recall Verna Myers, who's now um, mm -hmm. president or, well, chief of diversity and inclusion at Netflix, but she mm -hmm. was an attorney and a diversity and inclusion advocate. That was the first time I had seen an analogy such as that. She was like, diversity mm -hmm. um, is inviting people to the party. Inclusion is asking them to dance. That was mm -hmm. life altering for me because I was yeah. like, wow, that completely, right. you know, talked to my spirit, but also every mm -hmm. event I had been to where I felt like it was great to be invited. But if I had a terrible time, it was because I was just yeah. there off on my own, like, hi, yeah. I, I want to, I want to be in this conversation or, or right. Like and so what that led me to understand is that, um, diversity, it's good to have diversity, but inclusion is where is the actionable item, right? Mm -hmm. you have to reach your hand out to someone and bring them in. Right. And that's yep. such a necessary component. And, and also, um, there's a, a colleague of mine um, named Dawn Christian, and she was a guest on our show, and she's also going to be um, at our summit coming up. And mm -hmm. so Dawn had, because she was at the previous summit last year, and Dawn said something that was also a mindset shift for me. She said mm -hmm. inclusion drives diversity, which mm -hmm. made perfect sense. It was yeah. such a simple concept, but a powerful one, and I had not thought about that uh, prior. And then when we do think about it, Yes, when you create an inclusive environment, right, particularly yep. for somebody that was as young as you when you were at NASA, right, mm -hmm. um, when you create that kind of inclusive environment, what that's going to do, I would think, is draw people, again, that are like you with mm -hmm. young, fresh ideas into NASA, and then right. everybody benefits. You guys benefit yeah. from the experience of, you know, the older population there, um, and, and they benefit from your new, fresh, innovative ideas. Right. Mm -hmm. and so I love that party analogy. I really do because it's so dead on. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah invite me, but also make sure that I get the I get a good experience from it, that I have a right. in it, right? Yeah. So that just can't always be me taking it upon myself to say I'm going to insert myself. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Nobody yes. likes that person. So at all. Because <laughs> then it's like, what is she doing? I'm like, I'm trying exactly. to be included. <laughs> exactly. And what's funny is, you know, we could look at any situation from children, you know, yeah. to our traditionalist generation, you know, where if you're not asked to partake of an activity, mm -hmm. you know, how likely are you to feel as a part of the group and how yeah. likely are you to return, you know? Exactly. Yeah. But then with um, regard to, let's say, cultural competence, diversity and inclusion, what clear goals has this helped you establish in your work? I love this question. Um, so because I have been super, super blessed to um, do a lot of good work and affect a lot of different people in different ways. I, uh, I make it my business to make sure that my work reflects everyone to the best of my ability. So mm -hmm. whether it's the podcast or with the Savvy Solution, or if I'm just lending a hand at a grocery store, like I'm not just going to help the little old black lady. I'll help any little old lady or any young lady you know it's <laughs> whatever I do I try to be sure that it reflects my beliefs um and then with that I think it's really easy to have the goal to be inclusive or to be culturally competent but I try to actually just have practices in place so like anyone can say oh we're inclusive but are you really practicing do you have some like practices in place and so um, even just with the podcast, I, I really try to do a lot of research so that I don't seem like I'm only here, I'm only speaking to Black women. You know, I want anyone to be able to benefit with the Savvy Solution. Although I am a Black woman, I do research to make sure that my things like my website reflect that I'm open to anyone. It's not just about the other Black women-owned businesses or 
schools for black and brown kids. So just doing the research. And then my favorite goal that I have is just asking more questions. So I'm not afraid to say that growing up, our neighborhood was mostly all black. Um, it was low income. A lot of the schools I went to were black schools, inner city, low income. And so I was not exposed to kids who looked different than me up until high school when fortunately my mom got a better job and so we moved and then it was just like all white but even still it was just still black and white and so when I got to college and it was like purple people and orange people and just people from all over I'm like oh my gosh there are people from everywhere I made it my point to just ask more questions like I don't know I didn't know much about people from the Caribbean or people who were Haitian or people who were Jamaican like the first time I had some oxtails I was like tell me more about your culture and I know this sounds so crazy but literally the food made me want to ask some more questions and so now that I'm an older young adult I'm just like it's no problem having the goal and the actionable item to just ask the question so that people do feel included in this so that I don't offend anyone because I never want to you know, unintentionally offend someone based on something that this that's sensitive to their culture. So I really just try to ask a lot of questions, do my research and just be there. Like, don't be shy. Like, hey girl, I like that dance you were doing. Is that a cultural dance? You know, can I learn it? You know, if not, it's okay. But tell me tell me about that dance. Tell me about this practice that your culture does. And I've been enjoying it. I've opened my eyes to uh meeting new people, even people from the Asian community. It's just been really fun because, like I said, I'm nosy, but not because I want to know your business, you know? Because <laughs> you want to be a part of the business. <laughs> exactly. I want to know how to make that patty thing that you just made. And I want right. to know why your family loves it. <laughs> and you know what? I think that's that's the best thing ever. Food is a definite um kind of introduction. Um, and I like to say food is a passport you know, to every culture, because that's yeah. how I experience culture. I love doing that. And I always tell people, um, and it goes back to an actionable item, like you said, right? Mm -hmm. Making sure that we do what we say we are, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to, you know, profess to be a diversity and inclusion expert, then I need to engage with other people yeah. that are different from myself, right? And so, it, you know, people who look different, people who think differently, because mm -hmm. we may look the same and think very differently. Very different, right? yes. And so I also always want to be cognizant of that. But I love that you said um, you want to go and ask questions, because I think mm -hmm. that's the best way not to offend, right? Yeah. Because we won't know something that might be offensive to one person, yes. be, you know, commonplace to somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with food, it's, it's particularly fun you know, because mm -hmm. you get to enjoy something. So I always tell people, I, I will try anything once because I yes. can't say I don't <laughs> like something, you know, and I, I refuse to say I don't like something just because it might look strange to me. Right. Because my food might look completely strange to someone mm -hmm. else, right? And I, I always say, if I've tried it, the worst thing that can happen is I don't like it. So I don't need right. to the best thing is it becomes my new favorite dish and I can't exactly. get out of it, right? Yes. And so, you know, I think people appreciate um, when we do that. I think, you know, okay. because the worst thing, my family is from Haiti and, and mm -hmm. you know, as with many Caribbean and Latin American countries, you know, we offer people food when they come over. And I think mm -hmm. the, worst, the worst slight you can do to somebody um, is to refuse it. Right. Yes, and you would not so, be invited back. <laughs> right, it's a huge offense. So I'm just like, no, no, you know, try it. You know, the only time I think there's an exception is, you know, if somebody offers you like a plate of meat and you're vegetarian or vegan and you're like, oh, right. I hate that, you know, so I get that, you know, or for religious reasons, like you can't afford mm -hmm. it, perfectly acceptable. But to just be like, no, I don't want to try this. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. it, like I could <laughs> even imagine my family's face <laughs> just on my own. Like, oh, that's terrible, you know. So even if something looks completely bizarre to me, I'm like, you know what? Worst thing that could happen is I don't like it. So let me try. Right. You know? But I also mentioned how you said to be present. And that's a process, mm -hmm. right? That's something we yes. have to train ourselves to do. So mm -hmm. I think that's another actionable item. So if we we say we are, you know, engaging in diverse cultures and, and diverse practices and, and other people and experiences with them, we have to show up for it. You know, mm -hmm. a friend of mine um, said something to me a while back. She said, um, she happens to be Indian. And she said, you know, 
I'm going, the events that I go to, there are never any Indian people. And so it makes me not want to go. But then I realize I have to go to be present. And then other right. people will see that I'm attending and yes. I encourage them to attend, right? And I thought yeah. that makes so much sense. Again, something simple, mm -hmm. but actionable, right? And so yeah. for her to be um, more fully engaged and for her to mm -hmm. increase representation, right, mm -hmm. at these meetings, she has to go even if she's the only one, right? Right. Yep. People sometimes they we need always a brave person. Right. Right. <laughs> um, like, you know what? I'm just showing up, <laughs> you know? Right. And so yep. I love that that happens because it's, it's hardest on that person. Right. Yeah. Uh, because that takes a, a step. Right. And steps mm -hmm. are, you know, we like to stay in things that are familiar. And so when yeah. we go out there to do something totally different, it's like, oh, okay, for the next person, it's made that easier. So mm -hmm. I dare say, you know, for you being at NASA, you know, that in the role that you were, you know, that really will make it so much easier, I think. Not yes. easy, but easier. Easier, you know, yeah. For, for someone, you know, because that was NASA, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I certainly like, hope so. <laughs> I love that, right? Um, so I hope it would make, you know, another young woman out there that has mm -hmm. something in common with you, you know, be it race or mindset or mm -hmm. age or what have you, or being, you know, their major in school, I would love for them to see that, oh, somebody else did this, so now I Yes, did, right? yes. I totally agree. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so now we're gonna get to a word that I do not like uh, <laughs> as, as a person that works in the field of diversity and inclusion, but mm -hmm. uh, what, what effect do you feel political correctness has on your work or your industry? Because I know my thoughts about it, but this is your interview. So you tell me <laughs> how you feel about all of that. <laughs> So when I read the question, I said, hmm, it's a, I had to think on this one because I wanted to make sure I gave a politically correct answer. And no, I'm just no, kidding. No, no, um, <laughs> <laughs> right. So I'm thinking, well, I am fortunate that I don't want to say I have an on top switch, but like I consider my work the podcast and then I have the savvy solution. Although the podcast is like under the savvy solution, the podcast is more me literally in my whole 120 percent authentic self speaking into a microphone and so i i don't feel that i have to be politically correct mm -hmm. um and i feel that my listeners may agree i feel that i can just be who i am and that's i'm not offensive and i'm not degrading i'm just who i am and i'm speaking on the things i've experienced and what i know but when it comes to the savvy solution in my business Unfortunately, I, I do feel like that the term political correctness just has this this weight of it that I have to carry into meetings and especially meetings with people who I have to work super hard to gain their trust or people who may have been referred and they're like, oh, well, I thought this was going to be like a 40-year-old woman showing up and this is like a 20-year-old woman and oh my God gosh, she has long pink fingernails, you know, little things like that. And so I'm already having to like work, go the extra mile to gain the trust. And so I'm making sure that I'm correct. And I'm hard on myself if I say the wrong word. And I'm like towing around things. And I'm, it, it annoys me. Mm -hmm. It has an effect. Um, I wish it didn't because I feel like it makes people so sensitive yes. when really we don't have to be. Like we can just, just if everyone just respected everyone else as a being and as a person who has feelings and thoughts and emotions I feel like we could do away with political correctness but unfortunately it's not Jay's world and so I can't make the rules out here <laughs> so I just try my best to always show up as my authentic self but I would be lying if I said that sometimes I don't sometimes I do feel that weight of like am I doing this right and who's to say it's right or wrong but it's just like something in the universe is just like this may not be right and that as a young person, it, it, it's a weight. It's definitely a weight. I, I couldn't agree with you more. It is a weight. And you know what? I, being that I was an interpreter for 10 years. And so mm -hmm. um, part of our code of ethics was that we are accurate in our communications. And mm -hmm. what I learned um, through my work with cultural confidence and diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. was that political correctness was actually very inaccurate. Right. Mm -hmm. One of the terms that that I always use as an example is, and I think you and I discussed this, um, being African American versus being black. Yes. You yeah. know, like one is an ethnicity, like being Italian mm -hmm. or Irish or 
Austrian mm -hmm. or German, and the other is a race. So right. white and being black are races. And so being Haitian yeah. American and African American are two different ethnicities, right? Mm -hmm. And so we look the same, right? But we are mm -hmm. different cultures, but we're both American, right? Mm -hmm. It's just our ethnicities are different. And so with political correctness, like I see this across the board where you know, somewhere along the lines, you know, people came up with this set of rules that was based in, mm -hmm. and so it does become a weight, you know, and, and I know because of the, the work we do, we have to approach it differently, right, mm -hmm. and so for me, you know, I get to, I get to say, well, this is not the right thing to do because right. I show that right. inaccuracy, but I also know from the standpoint of, you know, operating in the space where, you know, these are your potential clients and people may not be familiar mm -hmm. with that. You know, that may be too hard of a subject to broach yeah. <laughs> during your initial meeting, right? Right. <laughs> you know? So that might not be the best business practice, but I do love that you answered it for yourself. Like you, mm -hmm. that burden, you, you remove it through outlets like your podcast, right? Mm -hmm. But also through showing up as your authentic self. Because I yes. think like when we let political correctness, you know, overtake the conversation, the scenario, you know, whatever it is that we're doing, mm -hmm. we're not showing up as our authentic selves. Right. Right. Yeah. And then we're putting up a wall. Yeah. Absolutely. We can't have real conversations. Mm -hmm. And then who loses your client by not getting the benefit of knowing and seeing who you are in totality? Right. Right. Yeah. So I always, um, when I talk to people about that from a business standpoint, I'm like, this is why, you know, this doesn't work. And, and recently mm -hmm. I had a conversation um, with, another business owner. And um, I, I said to him, you know, this is why political correctness doesn't work. And mm -hmm. so um, when I explained it to him about people showing up authentically, and it's not just white people, black people, right. um, Asian people, Latinx people, you know, um, Native American people, it's all of us. When each of us mm -hmm. doesn't show up authentically, then not only do we all lose personally, but we lose professionally. And that's yep. why I always think, you know, diversity and inclusion is good for business, right? Yeah. I always say, yeah. you know, to our listeners out there, put political correctness back where it belongs in a little <laughs> box and stuff it away, you know? Yeah. Showing up authentically is how we actually achieve the goal that we're trying to reach. Mm -hmm. You know, interconnectedness, inclusion, and all of that other good stuff. So yeah. that brings me to, to my next question for you. How has your work with the diversity and inclusion space affected your interactions with others, both professionally and personally? Ooh, spicy question. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so fortunately, when I worked at NASA, um, one of my mentors was the uh, deputy director for the office that oversaw diversity and inclusion. And she was amazing, a Black woman, and I just loved I loved everything she did. By the way, why do why do a lot of directors of D and I have to be black? But that's another topic for another day. <laughs> that's a podcast episode that I am waiting to have happen because I like I've met some who aren't, but we need more representation of uh -huh. men who are black, but also women who are not black. Right? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. I'm looking for them. So if they're listening. Please come be on the show too. Yes, come be on the show because yes. I just saw the director is also black, and I'm like, I love black people, but can we get more? Anyhow, more representation, um, yes, right. <laughs> but because they people. exactly across the spectrum, but because they were so so great, um, they pulled me in. Um, so just a quick backstory: I wrote speeches and oversaw communication strategy for the NASA directors in Huntsville. So a lot of outreach and outward facing things we did came out of my brain and in part in collaboration with my team members. So when it came to D and I, they wanted the thoughts of the leaders. And so that's how I kind of got clumped in and had a little a little bit to do with the D and I that NASA did, which is super, super awesome. So I said all that to say I got a lot of experience working in D and I in that space and professionally, I'm happy to say it made me more sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, more attentive and really more inquisitive mm -hmm. and at first I'll be honest I went in with almost like my black power blinders on like I'm this young you know, <laughs> <laughs> like I'm just here to help you say it in a way that's gonna make sure we don't get a lawsuit and 
we're going to be good. I'm just going to go right. back to my little office and, and finish writing up more communications plans. And mm-hmm. when they just kind of tapped into who I am as a person, they were like, Jay, you have so much more to offer. Like, what do you think about reaching out to the Hispanic group and to the Asian group? And I was like, I don't know anything about them. You know, most times what people probably feel about me and what it did was it turned the light bulb on. Like, that's exactly why you need to do it. You know, that's exactly. why you should do it. And so it made me just have more questions and really just be more personal and more open to being in those spaces professionally. And so now, um, especially living in Gwinnett County, I'm not as uncomfortable when it comes to professional settings, when it's, it may not, I may still be the only black woman, but it's not just me and all white people. I'm comfortable going up and speaking to someone who may be Asian or someone who may be Vietnamese or someone who may be Hispanic like I'm super super comfortable and I have to credit that to what my mentors at NASA did because they were like look girl you need to get it together because this is not a black world it's not Jay's world (laughs) as much as (laughs) as much as I want it to be and so as a as a young millennial I think we all need that at some point in our young careers because sometimes we do go into things like I'm the black token and I know that I'm just going to play my role and stick mm-hmm. to it. I don't have to interact with other people and that's not the case. And so that, that was really, really great to do. And then on the personal side, again, just made me more attentive, made me more present. Like I'm not afraid to just really walk up to someone like how even we met at the welcoming America event. It was super, it was super diverse. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I was so comfortable just saying, Oh, well, where are you from? tell me more about you know your culture I'm, I'm interested to know more just really being there to know more and so I'm glad that I've had those somewhat traumatizing experiences because it has made me <clears throat> appreciate the differences and want to just know more I just want to know more and then when I have the chance to talk about it whether it's with my friends on the podcast in the grocery store I do. I'm like, you don't have to be afraid. Like, you want to know why my hair does this? You can ask me, you know. It's not what you say. It's just how you say it. But if you, if you want to know why I love fried chicken, I would tell you. Because my grandma, that's all she had money to buy when I was little, fried chicken, you know. Oh <laughs> so, yeah. That is so funny. Working in DNI, it has opened my eyes. I, I took the blinders off. I took my black power blinders off, and it made me just want to know more and, and be be there for people who don't look like me. And I love that you said that, that you took the black power binders off, because in, in my experience, I've come across people, because for me, even though I was born and raised here, ethnically, I was raised hate to be Haitian. And so mm-hmm. what that did was give me a kind of, a different perspective about being black, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I looked at African Americans um, as foreigners, which they mm-hmm. are in Haitian culture. So, if I said, mm-hmm. you know, more than likely I'll marry a foreigner, that meant anyone who was non-Haitian, right? And for right. some reason, people thought like the black experience was you know, a monolithic one. And I was like, no, mm-hmm. we're, we're so different. Like, I will right. ask you, you know, about, you know, tell me about you know, growing up in the South, because I didn't know anything yes. about that, you know, as a Black person, you know, specifically as an African-American, tell me about what it's like to grow up in Alabama, right, you yes. know, and, but I won't assume that you know everything about the Tuskegee experiment, like, I can't, right, that, right? <laughs> and then, you know, what was funny to me was, um, when I first moved down here, um, I went to a friend's house, and she made fried chicken, and the thing is, I didn't grow up <laughs> eating fried chicken, culturally, it's not a food that we have, and mm-hmm. I tasted it, you know, growing up in New York, <laughs> and I realized I did not like it at all. <laughs> and I was just like, what do I do? Because I, it was hysterical, but it was terrible because I was like, right. why do you think I'd like fried chicken? <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> but I didn't want to be rude. And so I looked at my little one and I said, okay, you've got to take one for the team this time. You try this for oh my, my God. <laughs> And he looked at me like I was half crazy because he was like, I don't like fried chicken either. You've never made this. So, you know, it, it it was one of those beautiful, crazy moments. And I said, yeah. All right, I have to I have to step up. And I had to say to my friend, you know, thank you so much for making this. 
but I I physically oh. can't eat fried chicken. It makes me not <laughs> just, I don't like it. And and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna stand in my truth because I've tried it, so I know why I don't like right. it. I know what it does to me. <laughs> and yet still, even whenever we're going to any event here in the South, like people are just like, oh, have this fried chicken at some professional. Oh my I'm god! Like, you know what? <laughs> I'm just gonna eat around that, <laughs> you know. But but it makes me laugh because it it just always brings me back to that place where even yeah. within your personal friends, right? You know, mm-hmm. your friends of fried chicken bring up, you know, they evoke these wonderful memories of your grandma, right? Mm-hmm. Me, I'm just like, nope, can't go there. Right. My grandma made, other stuff. My grandma made <laughs> liver, onions, and boiled plantains, and I'm I'm just in my happy place whenever I get that, because it's like, oh, mm-hmm. I miss her, right, you know? Right. So, you know, it's one of those things where I know if I serve to, you know, other friends, they'd be like, what is this? And why do you right. have for breakfast? Like, I'm like, what? <laughs> it's good for every meal, so... <laughs> That, that just took me there for a second. That was so funny. I'm glad you shared that. I am. But I love that, you know, you say that you get to ask people, you know, about where they're from and they too in mm-hmm. turn will ask you where you're from mm-hmm. and, and, you know, talk about your experience. So, so mm-hmm. you know, within every, you know, racial culture, we will see that the experiences are not monolithic. You know, right. I mean, right. being, you know, Vietnamese is so different from being Korean, right? right? But yet everybody's Asian and it's different, you know, being Indian is being different from being, you know, Pakistani, but yet mm-hmm. both are South Asian, right? And I, I love that within that diversity within diversity, right? Mm-hmm. Like that always just makes me more yeah. intrigued and more mm-hmm. interested. And then people want to know about us, which is, you know, really great. And those, those questions, though, yeah, why does your hair do that? And how come, mm-hmm. you know, it was straight the other day? And I'm like, right. so but, and you it's know, 80 inches long. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I was like, it's not magical conditioner, you know? <laughs> and so I love talking to people about stuff like that because I think it it adds to to our mutual understanding of each other. And, and just mm-hmm. it can be fun, right? It doesn't have yeah. to be heavy all the time. It can be too right. fun. So yeah. on that note, my last question is, what two things would you like to impart upon our listeners? What would you like them to know about, about you and your, your work in the diversity space, your work as a communication strategist? What would you like them to know? You know, I just want to say to the listeners, first of all, you guys are awesome. You are awesome. If you're listening to us, you are awesome. But uh, the biggest thing, (laughs) I really just have one big thing, and it's just, it's never too late. And by that, I mean, it's never too late to start being inclusive. Mm -hmm. It's never too late to start the business, fall in love, meet someone new, travel, whatever it is that you have been putting off. Um, It's just never too late. So it was never too late to be nice to someone like you can start today because when you start things that you know you should be doing in the first place mm-hmm. you just give the universe and your faith the space to expand who you are and to stretch you even more and you become just a better person and we need better people like I think one big takeaway we talked about is like showing up authentically if everyone could just be their best version of themselves they can show up authentically and then we can be more inclusive and then we can break some barriers so just start and you know it's never too late whether you're 25 or 85 like get up do something because the world needs you we need you the kids of tomorrow needs you yeah we, we need each other so that would be my imparting <laughs> yeah that is fantastic so it's never too late and show up right? Show up. I I really love that you said be the best version of yourself because that is a choice. That is a conscious choice that we make every day. And it is not the easier choice, but it's the right choice. It is so not easy. Oh my gosh, that's a whole other topic. (laughs) It's so hard. Adulting is hard, right? Uh, (laughs) Yes, I did not sign up for this. Yes, it's hard, but it's so worth it. I think when you make the conscious decision that no matter what life throws at me, no matter what the day is, whether it's rainy, sunny, happy, sad, I'm going to be my authentic best self. You know, the world has no choice but to take notice. You know, when you walk into a room, people will know this is a real authentic person. And so 
I try my best. I don't always show up as my authentic self because some spaces are just, you know, shallowing out here in these adulting streets. But when you make the conscious effort, it's so worth it. <laughs> Did you all hear that? Make the conscious effort in these adulting streets because <laughs> this is how we, we get to navigate those those pathways and create our own traffic signs, right? Right. So right. on that note, right. Jay, I want to thank you so much for being on the Global Fluency Podcast today. This thank you for such having me. Oh my gosh, I loved it. I loved it. So tell our listeners where they can find you on social media, where they can follow you and the School of Life Podcast and the Savvy School. Yes. Yes, I know so much going on. So you can find me on uh, Instagram at underscore M-I-S-S-J-A-Y-E, so underscore Miss J. And then on Facebook, um, just Jacqueline East Washington. You know, the spelling is complex, so we'll be sure that you have a spelling or some a link somewhere. <laughs> and then uh, to learn more about uh, the School of Life podcast, you can follow me on Instagram at School of Life Pod. And then my all around all things J Washington website is jwashington.com. So find me, let's connect, let's talk, let's get our adulting selves together. You don't have to be a millennial. Like we're all on this journey together. I'm super happy to um, to talk, to chat, to share the little knowledge I do have um, and to create more partners in my network. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Jay, so much for being on the Global Fluency Podcast. It was wonderful having you on the show. And to all our listeners out there, let's keep the conversation going. Talk about this at the water cooler. What did you find interesting about our conversation with Jay today? Uh, put, uh, send us a message via Facebook. Send us a message um, at um, Westbridge Solutions at info at westgrouptraining.com. We want to know what you're thinking. So thanks for tuning in. And until next time, let's keep the conversation going. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions, LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences. Leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going, going, going.